Okay. Uh, so before we continue, anyone here, have you uh, spent time studying this book before? Have you tried or maybe taken a course or something on the book of Hebrews? Uh, I studied, but yeah. not in a taken a special course or something, but I studied uh, twice or thrice. Uh, mm. Especially, uh, I, I attend some, I was attending some discipleship classes. There, they were teaching a Hebrew chapter five and six. Uh, six, one and two mm. was foundational doctrines, and five, uh, ten, I think ten on talking about the maturity of a believer. So those things again, again, more than a one and a half year, keep on meditating about those two chapters. Uh, means uh, about the righteousness of God and uh, the foundation, six foundation. But they start with these two chapters. The the two chapters are so deep uh, things and all. And uh, so in Hebrews chapter four also will uh, uh, we meditate so much and talking about the divine rest. And the living word of God, and it's it's a wonderful book. And uh, Hebrews chapter nine talk about the covenants. That's uh, really beautiful. In chapter eight, nine, and ten, explain about one and new covenant. And uh, it's talking about. I think uh, I studied long before. I think it's talking about the marriage course in last chapter. Uh, after ten, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, things are there. The first. One, two, three chapters talking about the Jesus divinity and his uh, supreme authority and uh, how Jesus is above all the prophets and how Jesus is the son of God. He tried to prove and he explained very well. Uh, we can understand the Jesus deity and the tree of God and the supreme authority of Jesus. So this book of uh, rich of divinity and uh, doctrines. Thank you, ma'am. Wow, thanks, uh, Thomas. That was another summary that uh, you know you made of the book of Hebrews, and it's really helpful uh, for us, uh, you know, as a class. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to check with all of you uh, because I have read personally, like I haven't, uh, I, you know, what can I say? The the understanding that I have today uh, from the book of Hebrews, I've read Hebrews several times, but you know, never really uh, got that depth of, of uh, revelation. But I I know from the time I kind of started teaching it and then started studying deeply, little by little, little by little, as uh, Thomas said, you know, as you're meditating, uh, you you begin to um, see so much. Uh, in in just you know like a word in the book so uh, i really encourage us to do that okay take your personal time uh, to study uh, kiran you i saw you raising your hand you wanted to say something yes ma'am just little mm -hmm. i want to yeah. one minute go ahead, go ahead. The, i i remember once i finished the hebrew and over there i learned like faith the great example of faith chapter 11 is given over there and Brother uh, Thomas, he was just sharing, then I also feel like a little bit to tell like uh, so many things I learned on that moment is still is there covenant of God and the promises for chapter, the promises of God, the uh, resting of God's promises is so powerful. Man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so true, Kiran. Yeah, and thank you for, for sharing. Uh, so let's continue. Let's uh, continue. We were in Hebrews chapter 1, um, verse 4. And that says, Now having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So, so far, you know, we've seen various characteristics. And as Thomas pointed out, these are all foundational doctrines. And uh, I, I'm sure you have touched on many of these things in the course called Christology. Now, in addition to what we saw earlier, we're being told that he has become so much better than the angels. Okay, And that is being qualified. We are being told how he became you know, greater than the angels. Um, 
the primary reason why the lord jesus is greater than the angels there are other reasons as well but main is by inheritance he has by inheritance and as i already talked about him being the heir i told us that only a son or a daughter can be the heir of a household not a servant not a uh, you know even if you want to say a minister somebody who is serving the household they will not receive the inheritance it's only someone who occupies the position of a son and so verse 4 says jesus is better than the angels because he is a son the angels are not sons and daughters no they are not we'll see later what their function is but why is he greater than the angels because he is a son and by inheritance we are told that he has a more excellent name not just because you are a son just because you are a daughter you don't even have to do anything you receive the inheritance of the father and we are being told here not just the inheritance has a more excellent name you know the greatest name we sing about name of jesus why is it great it's great for many reasons one reason is found here by inheritance just by the virtue of the fact that Jesus is the son of God the only begotten son of God his name is great it carries that authority okay so by inheritance he is greater than the angels his name is great and we see a conversation here now uh, the passage over here it's actually taken from the old testament passages so some portion is from uh, psalm 2 uh, and uh, some some of it is from second samuel okay 7 so let's read it it says for to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son today i have begotten you and again i will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son so basically the writer is once again emphasizing that the lord jesus is a son to the father and you know sometimes uh, it's it's our understanding um, of a concept improves when we make a comparison so he is just using that that method here and he say when you compare the lord jesus to the angels think about this never once did the father call any angel as his what begotten son never okay now some might argue that the angels are called as the sons of god in you know some portions of scripture but you know those terms are not to convey that uh, the angels are uh, begotten by the father okay but uh, one of here and there you know there there are there are terms like that but obviously uh, when we understand interpreting of scripture we know that it doesn't mean that they were begotten of the father okay so by comparison we uh, draw a conclusion here that it is only the lord jesus whom the father called as his own son now moving on verse 6 but when he again brings the first born into the world he says that all the angels of god worship him and of the angels he says who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire so you know he is terming um, the lord jesus as also the first born so he says uh, again brings the first born into the world referring to the lord jesus as the first born now we know that the lord jesus is the only begotten of the father and also thereby he is the first born uh, or the or the or the the first one okay, who is born of the father and you see that the angels are in subjection to the lord jesus so for as i told you during those times 
there was a philosophy floating around where angels uh, were worshipped and uh, it's clear that the writer wanted to demolish that and he's showing the listeners that the angels are subject to Jesus. What is their role? They are worshipping. Let all the angels of God worship him. So obviously, Jesus is greater than the angels. And then, you know, we are being told that the father, when he uh, addresses the angels, you know, he, he looks at them as what? He looks at them as, yes, the angels are spirits, okay? And they are ministers. Now, the word minister, we've studied about this also in the book of uh, you know acts and we we saw how ministry has to do with service so what are angels angels are engaged in service unto the lord and he says that they are spirits but they are also just in service unto the lord and they are subject to the lord jesus because the lord jesus is superior to the angels so that is being established very very clearly and now now that he has clarified that angels are ministers okay uh, he goes on to say in verse 8 but to the son he says So who is this? The Lord Jesus, the begotten son. How did he get an excellent name? How did he get, you know, his greatness? By inheritance first. So to the son, father, again, you notice this earlier, we saw that God speaks to us in various times, in various ways. God wants a relationship with us but you also see a relationship between the father and the son so here verse 8 says but the son he says so there is communication there is relationship your throne O god is forever and ever how does the father refer to the son he could have said my boy you know uh, my lad some some expression like that to talk to a son but how does the father refer to the son here? It says, oh God. The father is addressing the son as what? Oh God. Now that also doubly makes it clear for us that the Lord Jesus is God. So the Trinity, you see, the Trinity, the, there is the father and there is the son. They relate to one another. Of course, we uh, will talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit soon. There is relationship. There is harmony. And what does the father consider the son? As God. So deity. The father is ascribing deity to the son. So I told you, right? The picture of the Trinity, the understanding of the Trinity also comes through with what is being spoken so the father and the son are in unity and the father is honoring the son as god or deity and uh, this is you know pulled off of uh, psalm 45 where um, uh, in that context you might think that you know it's it's being spoken of uh, of um, david but not really. No, you have the father referring to his son, the Lord, Jesus Christ. And see how beautiful the prophetic is. You know, at that time when the Psalms were written, uh, it was probably written with the understanding of that person's life. But it's actually talking about something more eternal, the interaction of the father and the son. So you know, we see here that the father refers to uh, his uh, son as God. And says, your throne is forever and ever. Again, about the person of the Lord Jesus. What do we understand? You know, we saw that he's a savior. We saw that uh, you know, his word is powerful. We saw that he is the best representation of the father. You add to that, you know, the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus. Because it's mentioned that there is a throne and that is forever and ever. You know, eternal rule and reign. 
that is how great and how superior the lord jesus is so the writer of the hebrews is saying you know people come on you know you stop looking down look at jesus look at all that the lord jesus is he is also a ruler your throne is forever and ever Okay, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that great um, uh, for us to grasp that, you know, what a mighty, what a mighty savior we have. Okay, we'll, we'll talk more. We'll talk more about it later. And it says, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So the values of the kingdom, what kind of a kingdom? You know, there are all kinds of kingdoms. Some kingdoms that are established in corruption, some kingdoms that are, you know, established uh, in injustice uh, with, you know, all kinds of wrong values. But here is a ruler, an eternal ruler. And what is his kingdom based on? righteousness okay wow that that's a, that's amazing he has a great kingdom and he has a righteous kingdom uh, and then you know we are told the kind of life that the lord jesus lived and the person that he is uh, it says you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness so that is a, a picture of a very just king he is right he is just when you look at, uh, you know, the standards, what is righteous is righteous, what is unrighteous is unrighteous, and such is the ruling of our king. So there is justice with him, okay? And we are told that his heart is for righteousness. But when he sees lawlessness, what is the response that Jesus has for that? You know, he condemns it. He, he is not pleased by it. And because of this kind of a righteous person that the Lord Jesus is, we are told that he, that God has anointed. Or again, you know, there is, there is a work that the father has done. He has appointed. Now you find that he is anointed. He is anointed with what? With the oil of gladness. Okay. More than your companion. So once again, you, we look at the beauty of the Lord Jesus. And when we look at his beauty, we, a lot of people have described his countenance, his face, which is glorious uh, and, you know, so much at peace. There is that joy. Even when Jesus spoke to uh, his disciples before departing, he said, hey, my peace I give to you. you know, who can have peace and joy in a time of great suffering? But the Lord Jesus because there was also an anointing of gladness upon his life. Wow, isn't that wonderful that the father has an anointing of gladness. In other words, he can pour out gladness and he had poured out that gladness on the Lord Jesus. So we know that the Lord Jesus, you know, when we think of his person, you think of this cheerful, calm, uh, you know, strong person. Okay. And uh, this is our ruler. This is our just king whose throne is for ever and ever. And this is how the father is addressing the son. He says, your throne is forever. And this Jesus is anointed with gladness. Let's continue. <coughs> Excuse me. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Okay. Again, what is what are the terms that are being used by the father to address the son? We saw God, now Lord. Okay, These are all uh, terms that are only used. If you look at the Old Testament, these are Lord is only used, you know, uh, for Yahweh. It was forbidden to use Lord for anybody else because it is blasphemy. However, the writer of the Hebrews, you know, he's taking the reference of, of uh, these passages and he is helping the believer understand, look, believer, this is how the father has addressed the son. So who is the son? The son is also deity. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. So many pictures of the son. He, we saw that he's a savior and, you know, he's the representation. Now what? creator creator in the beginning laid the foundation of the world 
and when you read from john chapter 1 right so in the beginning was the word creator is one thing but because there is the term beginning here self existent god he is not a created being sometimes when um, uh, we we consider when we talk about believers authority and uh, overcoming the devil a lot of people are scared of the devil because they think oh satan you know the kingdom of darkness is uh, 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 opposing the kingdom of god the son of god but you see there's no comparison because satan is a created being what about the lord jesus in the beginning laid the foundation in the beginning god okay in the beginning was the word he is self existent almighty nobody created our god nobody created jesus so you see so much is coming out of of these these words here so you lord so the term that was used for yahweh is used for jesus it's clear cut established you know uh um, that he is god the way jesus himself claimed remember we studied in the book of john before abraham was i am and what happened to the people they all started opposing him and said how dare you say that okay it's blasphemy you cannot compare yourself with god but here the writer of the hebrews is saying look the father terms the son as god and lord he is god he was there in the beginning self existent nobody created him and he is also the creator laid the foundation of the earth okay so that is the beauty of the person of the lord jesus and the he also says and the heavens are the work of your hands wow what a creator the world the heavens okay he has created all things everything Okay, has 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 come through the work of the Godhead and also the person of the Lord Jesus, and we are being told here that Jesus. Three things we we saw. One, I mean, we are going to see. One, we said self-existent. Then we said creator. Now look at this. It says, "And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain." so add another truth to it immutable meaning he can't be destroyed even the heavens the earth we just sang of the glory wow you created this beautiful world god you created the beautiful heavens however they are perishable meaning at some point they will be gone but look at this the father is telling the son you remain so the lord jesus is we use the term immutable okay also that also implies that he doesn't change but he remains okay he'll always be there he cannot be destroyed wow this is the god we serve he cannot be destroyed and then we are told about the heavens right we are told that you know what at some point they will all grow old like a garment like a cloak you will fold them up so it shows the authority of the lord jesus have you ever um uh seen you know some some maybe maybe a uh, a uh, uh, a cloth you know with a painting for for uh, display okay maybe it it had it had been displayed for a while but after a while what happens people may roll it up they say ha okay time up we don't really need this painting anymore just roll it up okay in some cases it's not even neatly rolled up they kind of just remove it just crush it okay put it aside next painting is up It, and we are being told about the universe and the heavens you know that kind of language is used how can you even use that kind of language i mean it's the great mighty universe you're talking about but in comparison to the creator of that universe we are being told 
how does what kind of authority does he have on, on the world on the heavens they'll all grow old like a garment like a cloak you will fold them up wow and this jesus is almighty no add that word to the description of the lord he's almighty he just take the heavens you know crush it up like a cloth fold it up like a cloth put it away as simple as that okay so and that is the authority that he carries he is the almighty and the great god and you know the scripture continues there and they will be changed so the way we are more familiar with maybe the uh, computer and you know we all have these laptop um, uh, some images on our screen and we prefer to change it from time to time we may have pictures of our family members uh, you know or things like that on it and we just change it but we are being told that the authority and the greatness of our lord jesus is you know even this world the heavens at some point he is able to just change it okay he can change it they will be changed again referring to the immutability of our god we are told but you are the same yeah the heavens can be changed the earth can be changed how can you be changed oh god you can't and you are the same so in saying you are the same you know later again in hebrews chapter 13 we will see the the writer saying jesus christ the same yesterday today and forever what the writer is saying is oh believer why are you so shaken up by the uncertainties that you are facing and as i've been telling you persecution opposition lack all these uh, uh, pressures were upon the believers at that time and today for us we have you know we are in a world of a pandemic like our um, previous couple of generations also might not have seen something like this and we are wondering god everything is changing so quickly the the rules are changing so quickly what is our anchor look at this look to jesus and we are being told you are the same you know the power of our god doesn't change his intentions right he is a good god he is a just god uh, he all that doesn't change his love god so loved the world his love for us doesn't change his character the person that he is doesn't change and we began this passage by uh, seeing that you know the lord jesus is the exact image of the father right so the person of the godhead all of them all of them their personality doesn't change it remains the same okay the righteous god that we serve he remains the same so what a confidence the believer can have that everything can be uncertain even the heavens can change the earth can change but earlier we saw that phrase you remain and now you are the same okay so uh, we we sing all these songs right on christ the solid rock i stand all other Uh, ground is you know sinking sand so unchanging unchanging great god okay and that is our focus and so the writer is inviting the believers come on believer wake up wake up this is the lord jesus for us and what a wake up call for us as well when we keep shifting our focus to the lord jesus and then we are told and your years will not fail okay again we began earlier by saying in this uh, in this passage that in the beginning okay so he is a self existent god he was there in the beginning and we are told your years will not fail talking about his end there's no end and that's why you know we we see in the book of revelation alpha omega in fact he is the beginning he is the end okay and that is the lord jesus for us how beautiful never ending never ending it's like you know sometimes you uh, uh look at something and you're going wow maybe the sky the beauty of the sky if you're watching the sky you're like wow morning it's like this beautiful afternoon it's like this beautiful evening it's like this beautiful look at the person of the lord jesus that's what's happening to us as we're reading these verses we're going oh 
he's the creator he's immutable you know he's self existent he is the beginning he is the end he is the savior he's everything and so uh, the writer of the e hebrews is is just encouraging the hearts of the believers and asking us to focus on him now verse 13 again a little bit more comparison uh, with the angels okay so he wants to make it very clear that come on stop worshiping angels they don't even they don't come anywhere near where the lord jesus is so verse 13 he says but to which which of the angels has he ever said so he's asking them to reflect back on the scriptures and says no no where do you find the father speaking to the angels in the same way it was only to the son that he said that sit at my right hand till i make your enemies your footstool so to none of the angels he spoke like this now one more thing that you see here is that the position of the lord jesus we said that he is seated who made him sit there look at the relationship of the father and the son so it is the father who has told only his son not the angels sit at my right hand so the son has full permission okay to sit in the greatest place nobody else has the authority or the opportunity or the credibility to sit at the right hand of the father but the father has invited the son so can you understand how great the son is come sit at my right hand one more thing about the lord jesus you find here that he is victorious because what did the father tell only the son till i make your enemies your footstool okay footstool refers to something at one's feet okay and uh, in this context footstool is something that is overcome so the enemy or the enemies whatever enemies there are in the world jesus is victorious over those enemies and who is happy to give jesus the victory the father is happy to give jesus the victory okay and that is the relationship within the trinity but to none of the angels god ever spoke these words and so the writer is saying please try to understand that angels are all ministering spirits or they are serving spirits okay uh, and they have been sent forth to minister you see an appointment there as well they have been told to serve who do they serve we saw earlier that they worship the sun they are under subjection to the sun so who should we worship we should worship the sun and not the angels and the believer is also being told that the angels okay this is a little small teaching about the angels right here that angels are serving spirits okay they also have a function to serve who it says those who will inherit salvation the lord jesus has bought our salvation so the believer okay is the one who has salvation who is inheriting salvation so who should the angel serve the believer so again you know to apply this in our daily lives you know you and i have the help of the angels in some of the versions uh, you you have like aid ministering spirit sent to aid those who inherit salvation aid meaning help so we have the holy spirit who is helping us but also sometimes you know if we pray prayers where we say lord send forth your angels you know there are many roles that angels play we won't go into that um, you know they protect they bring a message um, uh, and, and they do you know whatever the word of god they are activated by the word of god so they they function in many ways but we can pray and say god send the help of angels to us if a believer prays like that is it correct or wrong uh, yeah it is definitely correct you can pray and ask god god send your angels to help us okay because that is their responsibility and the angels are activated 
you have uh, you know another uh, scripture in the old uh, testament i'm not uh, able to recall it right now but you know it says that hmm, at, at the word of god they go by the command of the word of god so they are activated by the word of god as we speak the word as we confess the word you know they get activated and that's how you engage angelic help in your life you speak god's word and the angels will begin to move and do their function uh, they have a function and their function is to serve the believer who is the inheritor of salvation so you know the first section here uh the writer has beautifully talked about the um deity of the lord jesus and the superior or superiority of jesus over the angels okay so now let's move on to chapter 2 okay everyone doing good so far any thoughts additional thoughts any questions so man i really want you to enjoy this uh, this book with me okay no no passive listening so any anything at all that you want to say okay maybe you're soaking it all in because there's so much so that's fine Okay, so let's uh, move on and get started with chapter two here. Now, what are we going to see in this chapter? Again, it's beautiful. The focus is Jesus only. Okay, focus is not going to change in this book, uh, and we are looking for who is Jesus. That's the question. Okay, not just for the book of Hebrews, but whenever we are reading the Bible, we can ask that question: Who is Jesus in what I am reading? So, who is Jesus in chapter two? of uh hebrews we will find that the lord jesus is shown as fully man what did we see in chapter 1 the lord jesus is being revealed as fully god no questions asked equal to yahweh the father is calling him god lord so fully god no doubt about it chapter 2 the same writer is going to reveal the lord jesus as fully man fully man he suffered he understood our pain you know he 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 the term that is used is brother jesus is our brother he became that relatable uh, as he became a man and that is what is going to come out of hebrews chapter 2 so come on let's continue okay and as i told you earlier i'm not going to have us read the uh, book so yeah i'm sorry about that but we we will have to uh, just have the book open in front of us and look at it okay starting from verse 1 here so the the writer says therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away so the believer in this context under persecution uh the writer is encouraging them to fight the fight till the end you know and to not give up you remember when jesus uh, was speaking his parables he said that the seed the sower sows the seed but you know then there are there is seed which is taken away seed that does not develop deep root and one of the things that he says is there are plants that grow uh, in the place of thorns okay uh, and uh, they are not able to grow so then jesus explains and says those are difficult situations those are persecutions that one may face you see there is a quality that the stress of life and especially persecution um has you know and it can affect the believer negatively sometimes if the believer is not careful and that is why the uh, writer is encouraging and saying you know what believer you have to hold on tightly to what you have just heard so he says give the more earnest heed okay or in other words he is saying that uh, i just told you that the lord jesus is deity he's god he's great you know i i told you all those things so earnest heed means 
very carefully. I want you to consider these things. And you notice the passage here begins with therefore. We use the word therefore as a connector. When I've said something, like please attempt all your uh, three graded assessments because you will be able to fetch marks to clear your course. So I can't just say you will be able to fetch your marks to clear the course without connecting it to what I said earlier. You must attempt all your graded assessments. So it's a connector, you know, like that. So you find that the writer begins by saying, therefore, because the Lord Jesus is God and he's so great, please consider carefully, believer, don't get crushed by the pressures that you are going through right now. Because you, if you don't give the more earnest heed, meaning if you don't carefully or put an effort to keep your focus on the Lord Jesus, what might happen? He says, lest, you drift, lest we drift away. Okay, so he is suggesting that a believer can you know, drift away is like, have you, um, you know, kind of read about, uh, I, because more, many of us may not have seen a real ship and an anchor and also, uh, you know, ship, the ships that when they come to the harbor, they secure it with an anchor. If it's not secure with an anchor or a boat, take a smaller uh, vessel, a boat. If it's not secured with an anchor, what will happen? Slowly, just the, with the winds and the, the motion of the water, it might go far away from the shore. You can't, you can't hold it in its position. We call that drift away. So there is a possibility of another term that, you know, we can use to understand this is slip away so you know in the life of a believer generally when we find that you know believers have lost their fervor for god or become weak in their faith it's not something that happens overnight it's generally a slow process slip away drift away because our focus has shifted maybe our focus has shifted from jesus to you know, just our problems. Maybe our focus has shifted from Jesus to some sin, the repeated sin that, that you know, we, we are hooked to. Maybe our focus has shifted to, you know, various other things, but that is dangerous. And that's what the writer is saying. Come on, because of who, the greatness of our Lord, I want you to pay careful attention. Give your focus, lest we, drift away. There is a danger, believer, of uh, slipping away, going far away from God. Please don't let that happen. Okay, So that's how he is encouraging and bringing back the focus to the Lord Jesus. Verse 2. Then he says, look, for the word spoken through angels proved steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So he's saying, you see, we have to pay careful attention to the Lord Jesus. And remember, we started that passage by saying there is a message, a great message that God has spoken to us. And what is that message? Lord Jesus. You have to pay attention to that message. Now, there are, uh, uh, you know, we have paid attention to a lot of other things. And here he, he points out that, you know, that... If the words that were spoken by the angels, okay, if people pay attention to that, uh, and uh, you know, if if there is a consequence to to paying attention or not paying attention to the word of angels, you know, how much more of a consequence there is going to be if we and now he says neglect. He says, look, what, earlier he said, 
you pay careful attention and now he's saying if you neglect neglect is to be apathetic to say yeah whatever yeah something you know jesus yeah something basically your attention has gone off to other things maybe the the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life and the world has consumed us that salvation is you know just something on the shelf but he says come on believer you can't live your life lukewarm or worse still like cold so believer you no believer should be cold you have to be on fire because he says great salvation see if we have something great do you ever take it lightly i mean if you uh, I, i'm just thinking about myself if you buy a wonderful attire for let's say christmas you bought something you thought about it for a long time the whole year oh yeah wow christmas day uh, this is what i would like to wear and then you know finally it's christmas time uh, maybe a special christmas for some reason and you pick up that that garment of yours and you have it in your cupboard but do you ever treat it lightly we never do that you know i think twice oh where should i keep it if i keep it if i fold it like this oh the the thread might come out okay let me hang it here let me hang it because if there's something that is great for us something that is valuable we that has our attention okay but if there's something that is not great maybe i have a t-shirt which is like okay every day use you don't mind oh, okay keep it on the bed for some time keep it on the shelf for some time it's okay we neglect but if there's something that is great we give it our full attention and he's saying believer don't treat salvation lightly it is the most precious thing that we have the lord jesus what does salvation tell us god's love for us is so great the lord jesus loved us that he became a man and we are going to see all that later he died for our sins what is the result of that we have become a child of god when we have believed in him we have accepted his salvation not only has our position changed we have the inheritance of salvation you know we have uh, we have protection healing deliverance um we you know all the blessings the benefits of the covenant are flowing into our lives and not only that you know the the great penalty of sin otherwise you and i would have had to pay the price for sin but can you imagine god loved us so much we escaped the great penalty we escaped the great punishment you know we we have been blessed with god's love and his benefits now if a believer thinks yeah 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 it's all there yeah it's there that's all that's neglect he's saying how can you be like that don't neglect great salvation okay uh, and so you know he he's really trying to wake up the believer so class what we'll do is um we will continue from here in the in the next class and i really want you to take time maybe you can go back read the the passage the read different versions uh, and also you know use your uh, eso to look up some of the words uh, in the greek and understand it better and of course you know you have the commentary of david kuzik so spend time in it meditate on these passages and uh, you know we will meet once again in our next class so i uh, just want to request somebody to pray before we close today anyone i'll pray now yeah please father we thank you lord jesus we thank you for this wonderful time that you you have given us to for this opportunity to be in this class process and learn from your from the book of hebrew that you are superior to everything lord jesus and everyone lord but you are really superior to all the heavenly beings lord jesus and your name is above everyone and everything else lord jesus we thank you for this opportunity and we, we bless you we uh, give you glory we ask that every lesson that you learn that it be uh and give in, in uh in us lord jesus so that we can uh, live according to your word lord. we thank you in the name of jesus i pray amen 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 thank you thank you dev thank you everyone god bless you have a beautiful week i'll see you again next monday 
God bless. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.